Well, welcome to the Dave Cast. It is, let me get this up a little closer. It is uh, Saturday, June 6th. And today we continue with part eight of the Exodus series. And we have a whole lot to cover uh, today. Uh, and I also have an important announcement to make at the end of the program today. And so uh, let's just jump right back into the story because today we're going to be looking at some of the most dramatic aspects of the Exodus story, and that is the ten plagues. And there's a lot of symbolism here, uh, just like in the burning bush and Moses' staff and a few other things that we've already talked about. There's going to be some rich symbolism uh, that goes on here, and that will be interesting to look at, I think. And, um, and also, let me just make this point. We've been moving pretty slowly through Exodus, uh, but today we're going to speed up just a little bit and cover most of uh, chapters 5 through 11, because when we get into the plagues, you're going to find that it's basically the same pattern that's happening over and over and over with just a few nuances that I'll point out. Uh, but it is this basic pattern of Moses and his brother Aaron going to ask for time off for the Israelite slave. And so pay attention to this so that they may all go on a three day journey into the wilderness and have a festival where they're going to worship and uh, make sacrifices to God. It's going to be a festival, uh, as they call it. And so what with the travel time for three days in and three days out, they're asking for essentially a couple of weeks off for these uh, Israeli slaves, uh, something like 10 days to two weeks maybe. I don't know. Uh, but it's not really specified either. But anyway, that is what they are asking for. That's what they're asking Pharaoh for. And we talked last time that even though some of us might not be familiar with that, and we, we might thought that when Moses came, like I think it's the way it is in the Ten Commandments and the Prince of Egypt and maybe the way it's told in Sunday school, that he's, that he's coming and asking for the Israelites to be delivered from slavery so he can take them to the promised land. But this is what the Bible actually says. And so we struggled last time was with was that being deceptive since they really had no intent of ever coming back. Uh, and so I covered that last time. If you didn't get a chance to listen to that, you might want to go back and watch episode seven. Um, and so in chapter five, they make this initial request to Pharaoh. We touched on that last time. Uh, and not only, this we didn't touch on, not only does he not grant it, uh, he actually doubles down. And he takes away the straw that they have been uh, provided for the bricks and so their work gets a lot, lot harder because they have to go and, and gather the straw and whatever to, uh, to make the bricks. And the, the same amount of work is expected from them. And so um, we get to the end of chapter 5, and there's this one conversation uh, that I want to especially point out uh, that happens between God and Moses. It's right there, the last few verses of chapter 5. And what I want to do is I want to talk about it and flag it here because we're going to circle back down the road and uh, talk about it and the change that happens uh, to Moses. Uh, so all this has happened in the first part of chapter 5, uh, Pharaoh blowing off Moses and Aaron's request and then doubling down on the Israelites with harder work. And, and now I'm going to read you uh, the last uh, few verses of chapter 5. It says, starting with 22, it says, Then Moses turned again to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you mistreated this people? Why did you ever send me? Since I first came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has mistreated this people, and you have done nothing at all to deliver your people. Now, notice what he's saying. This people. Yes, this people. I think some translations may even say these people. Uh, and then it's your, your people, God. And so notice Moses' distance in his language. He's not saying my people or our people. It's this people and your people, God. And so notice there's no personal investment in the Israelites here. But this is going to change in Moses. This people are going, these people are going to become my people from Moses. So flag this and remember it for later on down the road. And then we get into chapter 6. And chapter 6 is about this sort of regrouping that goes on after this initial setback. You know, I don't know why Moses thought he was going to be able to, you know, kind of waltz in there and walk out. But, uh, you know, God kind of reassures Moses and Aaron that, that he's with them and God's going to make this happen. 
And then for some odd reason, there is this lengthy genealogy that kind of gets inserted here. And then we get to the end of that chapter, chapter, and it's Moses and Aaron committing to obey God's commands. And so we move into chapter 7, and this is the series of 10 plagues, which will be our main focus today. And, and let me just say, I'm not planning on spending a lot of time in detail on each individual plague, only to say there is this symbolism here, uh, starting with the number of plagues, 10, 10 plagues. So why? Well, I'm sure you probably know that there is a great significance corresponding to different numbers in the Bible. Uh, biblical numbers can be sort of a shorthand that points us uh, to something else, to something sacred. It, it signifies something deeper than just the actual number. And the number 10 is one of those significant numbers uh, in biblical numer numerology because it represents what it represents, a fullness of of quantity. And so did you know that the number 10 is actually used 242 times in the Bible? I mean, that's a lot. I, I did not know that. I know that only because I Googled it. Uh, but I did already know that the number 10 or the, the repetition of something 10 times was significant and that it is in the Bible a lot. Uh, for example, the phrase God said appears 10 times in the creation week of Genesis 1. And, and that's not by accident, because that's a way of saying that there is completeness in all of God's creation. Seven being, you know, seven days, a perfect number, and this completeness with the ten. So you got a ten and a seven in there. Uh, but then there are ten generations given uh, that lived on the earth before the flood waters came. Uh, then, of course, there's the Ten Commandments. We'll get to that in a few episodes there. In uh, the New Testament, you know, you see the ten virgins, the ten lepers. In the Gospel of John, there are ten I am's uh, that are spoken by Jesus. Um, the tithe is ten percent. And, and I could go on. There's others. But you get the point. And so there are ten plagues, meaning completely, fully plagued. And you better believe it when you see them. Uh, and they... Each one of these, and here's the other symbolism, and that's not, this actually doesn't come out in the Bible, but the Hebrew people would have known it, is that each one of these corresponds to one of the Egyptian gods that the Pharaoh and the Egypts worshipped. And so it's very much a way of saying that God is more powerful, that God is more sovereign than any of these gods. And as I said, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about these Egyptians' gods uh, because, well, first of all, I know very little about Egypt, Egyptian gods. I mean, I, probably like you, I did study the Greek and the Roman gods a little bit in my education along the way, both in high school and in college. Uh, and, you know, that was part of the core curriculum, not the Egyptian gods. And, and also the Greek and Roman gods seem to show up more in Western literature and sort of like questions on game shows like Jeopardy, but, but not so much the Egyptian gods. I mean, we know Ra, the sun god, and that sort of thing. And so I'm mostly not going to uh, a lot of detail about them uh, because I think the most important thing to get out of this is the significance that they tied in to the Egyptian gods and showed that Yahweh, the great I Am, speaking from the burning bush, you know, the Lord God Almighty, you know, that he was, you know, the God of the Hebrews – was much superior to all these other gods. And why this is important is, I mean, imagine the impact that would have had on the Israelites who were fixing to be freed and fixing to, you know, come into this understanding of, of the one God, you know, Yahweh, uh, Elohim. You know, they've been slaves there in Egypt a long, long time, over 400 years. And so I'm sure they knew a lot about Egyptians' gods and this one made a huge impression on them and, and solidified their beliefs, I believe. And so one of the details about these chapters where the, where the plagues are found, if you, if you read straight through, uh, then, then you'll be able to see that the first few of them, I think the first two or three, that they were able to be recreated by Pharaoh's court magicians. And so, you know, Pharaoh wasn't overly impressed. But, but after you get to... Three, uh, they're unable to do it. And so let me just quickly give you the plagues in order that they were. Uh, there was water to blood. There were frogs, lice, flies, livestock, pestilence, boils, 
hell, hell of fire, actually, locusts, uh, darkness, and then finally, uh, the last one, uh, killing of the firstborn children. Uh, and so uh, the only one that I really want to mention here is this Egyptian god, Geb, and uh, that corresponds to the plague of lights. And the only reason I am uh, mentioning it, I mean, Get was supposed to be, uh, I guess I'm pronouncing that right, Get was supposed to be over all the dust of the earth. And so that in and of itself, I mean, if you're going to pray to one of these gods, uh, the dust of the earth just seems a little thin to me. It, you know, it's kind of like Hawkeye and the Avengers. I don't know if you follow that Marvel stuff and the Avengers. You know, you've got Thor, Hulk, Iron Man, Captain America, all these guys with these incredible superpowers. And then you've got Hawkeye who shoots arrows. I mean, what is that about? But, but what really caught my attention about Geb, the dust god, uh, was this image of him having a goose on top of his head. Or sometimes he even wore the head of a goose. I mean... Does that exude great respect and power to you? And I thought, why in the world did he go around with a goose on top of his head? And I really couldn't find a satisfactory answer. If you know, please, uh, you know, message me or something. Uh, but I know that he considered the goose to be sacred. And so that's the Geb, the, uh, the dust god. But, but an important thing to notice if you read straight through and you watch is that there is this kind of upping the ante each time until the very end. And over this course of time, everything in Egyptian life and culture would have been devastated and, and wiped out. But, but it's incremental as it goes along. I mean, you start off with sort of dust gods and stuff like that, things that the Pharaoh's uh, magicians could in, imitate. But then it, it gets really severe. Uh, for example, the eighth plague, this plague of fiery hail that corresponded with the Egyptian goddess Nut, uh, who was the goddess of the skies. And so the crops, you know, that would have been burned up, it tells us, uh, were the flax and barley, which would have been ripening in the fields. Uh, and so it's important to note that these two actually aren't what they ate. They weren't the mainstay of their diets. But what they were used for was making clothes and alcohol. And so, uh, you know, each time it's up in the ante. And so that destruction would have made their life uncomfortable, but it didn't affect their food supply yet. And so Pharaoh still gets another chance to turn to the one God uh, before their food supply, you know, kind of gets messed with. And so you see this gradual building each time of the devastation. Uh, and so uh, the very next plague is the locust, which does destroy uh, the wheat. And so within the repetition, there are, are some details to point out. And one of the most important ones to note is as the plagues go on and get worse and worse, Pharaoh begins to start bargaining with Moses three different times. The, uh, the first time he says, okay, so you want to wear, uh, have this festival to worship your God. Why don't you just do it right here, Moses? And, and Moses says, no, no, it's got to be in the desert three days journey from here. And so at this point in the story, you kind of get the idea that Pharaoh knows that if he lets them do this thing, that they are not leaving and just going out and coming back. They're gone for good uh, because the next time he says, OK, well, you know, I get it. You need to go out in the desert for this uh, for this festival. But but who's going to actually do the worshiping? I mean, there's no reason for the women and the children to go, are there? And uh, Moses says, no, no, it's the whole family. The snow fam whole family's got to go. And so the next time, before the final plague, the worst one, the you know, killing of the firstborn children, Pharaoh says, okay, okay, I get it. You can all go with your families, but leave your livestock because you're not going to need your livestock out there. And so, you know, I don't know what Pharaoh is thinking. I mean, theirs has been wiped out, so I guess maybe he's thinking at least they'll have that. But he, he also may be thinking that this is kind of a collateral uh, to make sure that they return. And, and Moses says, nope, nope, it's got to be everybody. And so we get to that final plague, which is, you know, the death to the firstborn children. Uh, and that's where we see the Passover, where the Israelites were instructed to put blood over the door because the angel of death was going to be passing over and, and God would spare the Israelites if they, uh, if they put the sign of blood over the doorpost. 
And so this happens, and uh, Pharaoh relents and says, go. And so they do go, but one more detail to point out, and uh, that is that the Israelites then go and ask the Egyptians if they can borrow all the gold and silver, uh, which you know the Egyptians actually gladly give up, get them out of here, let them do this thing. Uh, of course, you know the Israelites have no intention of returning or, you know, or bringing the gold and silver back. And so, you know, that's complicated. It kind of gets into some of the things that we talked about yesterday. With you know, was this dishonest or not? And uh, there's this whole nother s- session that we could do on the significance of this because there are some people that interpret this as being uh, reparations uh, to the, the Egyptians were paying to the Israelites for all those years in labor uh, as slaves. And so that's a lot, and I'm already running, as I look at the clock, uh, running kind of short on time. And so I want to get something out on the table today in kind of an introductory way that, uh, that I will try to wrestle with and we'll try to unpack as, as we go forward uh, in this series. Uh, but... We are at a point where I think we have got to at least acknowledge the elephant in the room, and it's this. Um, And you probably have thought about this before. Why does God seem so loving in the New Testament, but angry and harsh and vengeful in the Old Testament? I mean, the plagues in and of themselves, I mean, stop to think about it. They seem a little bit over the top sometimes, don't you think? I mean, particularly when you consider the collateral damage to the Egyptians and then this death to the firstborn babies, what do they have done? Is Pharaoh sin? Why, you know, why all of this, this killing and death and destruction? Um, and so, um, you know, as we go further in the, along in the story, it's not going to get any better. Uh, and some text for us will be a little bit morally problematic uh, some of the quote-unquote crimes for which God prescribes the death penalty uh, when we see the law being given. Um, or there's this another section where God is getting ready to kill the Israelites because he's mad at them, and, and that's where Moses has to talk him down from it. And then ultimately, and uh, you know, we'll have to move on to another chapter for this, but I mean another book, but, but when Joshua fights the battle of Jericho, God is commanding the Israelites to basically commit what we would consider genocide. And so how do we make sense of this? You know, most importantly, how do we make faith out of this? Well, this is just a starting part of the discussion. Uh, But remember that these stories were passed down from generation to generation in the oral tradition by the Hebrew people long before they were ever written down. And they, and they were given to inspire and challenge and to keep them together as a nation through some pretty bad times when things were looking pretty dim. And so they told these epic tales, these tales of good versus evil, evil you know. It's kind of like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or something. They're epic tales, good versus evil, and don't, don't lose sight of that. And they were to remind the Israelites that they were God's chosen people. God was on their side and that eventually good was going to overcome evil, to encourage them and keep them together, together to, to give them hope. And so Moses and Joshua and David, all these people, they were Israel's heroes. They were larger than life. Uh, and these were stories were written down long time, you know, uh, I mean, they, before they were written down, they were told long time is, is a way to inspire and encourage their absolute commitment to God, God's chosen people. And so one analogy that I will give, and it's probably poor, uh, but maybe it'll help make the point, would be the story of William Wallace of Scotland. I'm sure you probably know it because of the movie Braveheart, but, but w- Wallace died way back in 1305. But to this day, he is a legendary hero in Scotland. You know, he fought against the English uh, and the wars for Scottish independence. And so every Scottish child is taught about William Wallace, and you go to Scotland, memorials to him are found throughout the country. Uh, and then Sir Walter Scott uh, expanded the legend with his, his writings, and some of this is based on truth, but some of this is a little bit legendary and a little bit expanded. And, of course, that uh, was 
was told in the in the movie Braveheart with uh, Mel Gibson playing the part of William Wallace. If you stop and look, really look at the story, and particularly if you talk to the English side of the things, uh, the English criticized Wallace's uh, method in war and, and accused him of killing civilians and things like that. Yet in Scotland, Scotland, he is this national hero. Hero, and so so what I'm suggesting is this: that perhaps these stories of conquest of Canaan and and the uh, Egyptian plagues and all that. Uh, they were kind of like the stories of William Wallace were to the Scots. I mean, they were written long after the, the time of these heroes when they'd actually uh, lived, and they were just, they're given to demonstrate courage, resolve, and faith, and to inspire the later generations who were struggling with their, with their own enemies. And so uh, those stories were written from the theological perspective also of the ancient Near East, where, you know, in the Near East, gods sent, you know, heroes into battle and fought alongside them and so you know uh no one reads uh sir walter scott's book on william wallace to find a model of ethics of war they they read it to be inspired by a national hero and, and so i think the the same was true of the book of of exodus it, it's not really prescriptive for us largely it's not um and there's a whole lot more about this topic and uh, as we go along. Uh, and there's been entire books that have been devoted to addressing the, the issue of violence in the Bible. But my goal today is, is just simply to point out uh, that there are some possible ways of making sense of this violence without justifying it. Uh, because I've found that, that a lot of times people tend to either carefully cut around the difficult parts of Scripture with scissors, sort of speak, and, and I do, as I've studied the Bible over the years, I think that's a mistake. Uh, th there are a great many ways in which God speaks to us through these biblical texts. And, and one of the most important ways, I think, can be a caution to remind us just how easy it can be for people of faith to invoke God's name in pursuit of, of violence or bloodshed and war and, and things like racism. You know, so many things have been done in the name of God, uh, the Crusades, the Crusaders marched into battle into Jerusalem in the name of Christ. Uh, you know, colonists from the old world, when they arrived here in the new world, our ancestors, you know, Bibles in one hand, weapons in the other hand to, to claim America for Christ. Uh, that it always wasn't totally done uh, very well. Uh, Nazi belt buckles. Do you know what no, Nazi belt buckles had on them? Uh, Gott mit uns which means God is with us, as they sought the extermination of Jews and other undesirables. You know, Christian nations for all time, you know, for the last 2,000 years, they've gone to war invoking God in their efforts. And so uh, this can be kind of cautionary of that. At the same time, it can be inspirational in the way that maybe Braveheart was. And so uh, I'm just getting that out on the table. I try to, you know unpack it a little bit more a little later on but i'm going to stop there for today because uh, i've already gone really long <laughs> and we'll get much detail later um i do want to do two things i want to remind conyers first folks uh that uh, during tomorrow's online worship service we'll be celebrating holy communion and so uh, we've done this to be the third time now uh so you'll want to have some bread and juice on hand for that when we get to that part of the service and finally, I, I do have this important announcement, uh, and that is uh, that I'm going on vacation <laughs> uh, starting on Monday uh, for the next three weeks. And so uh, during that time, the day cast will continue, but it's kind of be like uh, the best of. Uh, you know, it's like watching reruns of Ellen or something. So, uh, but we'll be featuring some of the previous episodes, some of the best of that. Uh, we got like 39 of them now, so uh, there'll be a few to choose from. And so you can look forward to seeing those on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays at noon. And I'll be back on uh, Tuesday, June 30th, and we will uh, keep continuing in Exodus. Uh, there have been some people have asked me, you know, when church is preparing to, to reopen, are you going to continue doing the Dave cast? And that is my plan uh, right now. Uh, for as long as I can, we may have to move to some 
uh, other kind of format, but uh, I enjoy doing this. I think it's a good way to reach out. And so my, my plan is, and especially as we continue with this Exodus uh, series. And so, uh, you know, keep bringing the hope, and uh, I will see you soon. Bye-bye.